Let's try Matthew 4. Those are senior moments. And I'm senior enough I can have those moments. So be thankful when you don't have senior moments. Don't take that for granted. Chapter 4 of Matthew, beginning with verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things will I give you, if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. Behold, angels came and began to minister to him. This evening I invite you to set your hearts and minds on this account and the tremendous significance it really has for us. But in doing so, I want to set the stage, if I may call it that way, by asking you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. This is the great chapter on the resurrection, as I think you know. Turning to verse 45, 1 Corinthians 15. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Sometimes that's translated the second Adam. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. Jesus Christ, of course, coming from heaven to take upon himself human nature. And one of the frameworks that God has given us to appreciate and understand the, first, the second Adam is, of course, to understand the first Adam. Will you turn, please, to Genesis. Chapter 3. Now the serpent, verse 1, was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the, tree, the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. Notice, of course, the dishonesty there of adding a constraint that God had not stated of touching the tree. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, this is now reasoning on her own, 
and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, three illicit reasons. She took from the fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. The account of the fall, remarkably brief, immeasurably and infinitely profound. And I submit that we rightly are to understand this temptation of Christ is one of the many aspects of being the second Adam. Look again at verse 1. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So this was planned from eternity that he would be tempted in ways that would be extremely effective in principle, although thanks be to God, not indeed in practice. But this is the beginning of the temptations of Christ. I think that the word, the temptation of Jesus, is a bit misleading because this was really the formal beginning of his work as the second Adam from the perspective that is involved in the opposite of what Adam did. Adam yielded to the temptation of the devil. Christ clearly was charged with going into the wilderness and resisting the devil's temptation. Now the circumstances, I think, demand some sympathetic consideration. Christ was weak from fasting. And I don't know if any of you ever tried to fast 40 days, but I admit I don't have the stomach for, again, no pun intended, uh, but I don't have the will to go 40 days of fasting. And if we take seriously what it says in verse 11, the devil left him and angels came and began to minister to him. And clearly he needed angelic ministry after that severe deprivation and weakening. And most of us know that when we miss several meals, we can feel indeed uh, need of nourishment. So here we are, and Christ goes to a particular location, the wilderness. The wilderness. Consider that. Because the first temptation took place in paradise. In Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, the evangelist tells us that the only companions Christ had in the wilderness were wild animals. Adam had a perfect comfort in the garden. He had no afflictions, no discomfort, no hunger. He had a companion, it was Eve, and he was not famished, but Christ was. We can say, I think, without exaggeration, that Adam's environment was overflowing with blessing. It's not an accident that it was called paradise. That, that term is used to describe where Adam and Eve lived before the fall. He was in paradise and an earthly expression of it. Christ is in an environment that shouted curse, the barren wilderness. And if you enjoy or find it uh, significant in reading the Old Testament prophets, time and again, one of the ways that God through the prophets indicated his displeasure in Israel is using the illustration of turning a fruitful land into a wilderness or a desert. So here we are with an account that requires us to consider not just the words, but the context. Before the fall, Adam was a stranger to hardship. Consider that. He didn't have one single aspect of his life to complain about, to be troubled by. Christ, we can say, had known nothing but hardship from the time he was a little chap. And growing up in a very poor family in a country that was economically in difficulty and that 
had many problems. And so here he enters into this temptation, in a sense handicapped by fatigue and hunger and poor nutrition, or poor f sustaining uh, for that 40-day period. So what's the first temptation? Well, we have it recorded in verse 3. The tempter comes and says to him, If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, I w command you that these stones, you command that these stones become bread. I think we would be presumptive to not carefully appreciate that this temptation had several dimensions. First of all, I think we can rightly say it's a sneer if you are the Son of God. It's a contemptuous, condescending sneer at the deity of Jesus Christ, raising a question that uh, is, in one sense, absolutely intolerable and, and uh, evil beyond words, if you are the Son of God. By the way, remember, that's what Peter said when he asked to be given the ability to walk on the water. And I tie that link together to give us a sense of realizing that this is not just an abstract event establishing Christ's Messiah claims, but this is also an account for our benefit <coughs> and our growth in grace. It was a temptation to repel against God's will because this had been planned. The Spirit led Christ into the wilderness to be tempted. And it was a way to get out of the difficulty of the temptation, the weakness of hunger. It was really a temptation to rebel against God's plan of salvation, which included suffering. Jesus Christ had to suffer in countless ways. It was a temptation to let his physical feelings overrule what he knew was right and holy and good and to meet a need in a way that was inconsistent with God's will and word. It was a temptation to put the physical ahead of the spiritual, to con make a concession that was evil to well, it was probably a very strong appetite and hunger for food. It was a temptation to doubt the wisdom of the Heavenly Father in putting Christ through this trial. So the temptation was to abuse Christ's relationship with the Heavenly Father in order to satisfy a momentary need. Do you think any of us have ever been in a situation like that? Where we've had an urgent need and been tempted to take a road or route or solution that was expedient but not godly? So what was Christ's response? Well, look carefully what he says. It is written. Now when that statement is made, that's a clear call to say the Scripture says, God says in the Scriptures, it is written, the Word of God says, and then fill in the blank. And if you remember Christ's high regard for the supremacy of the Word, even over miracles in terms of effective instruction for the kingdom, this is powerful that he, the Son of Man, who had supernatural power even in his fallen estate, preferred to defend himself and to resist the temptation of Satan by referring to a quote from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. He reaffirmed God's priorities in not only what was said, but how it's to be said and understood. Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, which comes first, you know. 
the spiritual bread of life, the word of God over the physical bread that he gives us. So he showed here at the beginning of his public ministry a commitment that we would maintain throughout his three to three and a half years here on earth and again and again citing scripture as the basis of his response. He upheld the preeminence and the sufficiency of God's word right from the beginning. And if you note in verse 7, which is Christ's response to the second temptation, and verse 10, his response to the third temptation, each of his answers begin with those three words, it is written. And I believe, dear ones, our hearts have to be very dull not to appreciate that. So what was the second temptation? Well, you see that in verses 5 and 6. The devil took him into the holy city, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. The devil quotes scripture. He quotes a passage concerning a wonderful promise of God to care for his people in times of trial and danger. And so how does he begin? Well, the first thing he does is quote scripture. He was resisting the temptation to abuse God's scripture and therefore in abusing scripture to abuse God's will and to gain acceptance by an evil miracle. And it would be a miracle if he threw himself off the temple and the angels came and caught him up before he hit the ground. That would be a, an absolute destruction to the plan of salvation because he came as the suffering servant with a humble heart. And throwing himself off the temple to gain fame would be the antithesis of everything that Jesus Christ stood for. But again, he centered his resistance to temptation on it is written. That's beautiful. So what of his response? We can say he refused to enter into temptation, particularly the temptation to misapply God's word. Notice the first temptation, to gratify an appetite illegitimately. The second temptation to misuse the gracious, providential promises of God, to misuse the heavenly originated care that God has for his covenant people, to abuse that, abuse the promises. Well, what of the third temptation? You find that in verses 8 and 9. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Now we read the account of the temptation in the garden. And Satan tempted Eve first, and then of course Adam uh, as well, with the false idea that they wouldn't be subject to the penalty God had stated if they ate the forbidden fruit. The temptation to disbelieve the word of God. And here Satan is tempting Jesus Christ to disregard and therefore to disbelieve the word of God in terms of a crucial principle that he stated after quoting it as written. You shall worship and serve the Lord your God and serve him only. Only shall you worship God. Only shall you serve him. And so this was a temptation to step outside the will of God, to commit idolatry, and really to worship Satan. But also, consider this, to avoid the way of the cross. Had Jesus Christ done this, 
for a short season there would have been no opposition to him, we properly surmise. He would not have encountered the many, many cruelties and unkindnesses and dishonest statements and so on of the devil's servants had he just been willing to bow his knee. And he refused. I think this is a somewhat of a side issue, but one that ought not to be bypassed in this. Notice what he asks. If you fall down and worship me, get down on your knees, possibly he meant to prostrate. He wanted Christ to prostrate himself before him. But an act that could have taken no more than two or three seconds. And yet the history of the human race would have been changed forever. There would have been no hope of heaven for anyone. And the side issue that I want to at least touch on, dear ones, is the fact that there are many things we do that we could call trivial or of not of great consequence. But there are other things that we can do that are very simple and yet have eternal consequence. And when it comes to worship, who we bow down before has eternal consequence because God has made us to be his worshipers. And the essence of rebellion against God is to rebel against his requirement and deserved right to be worshipped as he himself indicates. Um, my wife and I in our personal devotions are going through the portion of the Old Testament that has the prophets that dealt with the decline of Israel and the captivity into Babylon and so on. And I'm struck again, as I have been in the past, with how often God summarizes the evil of the Israelites because they put up altars and bowed down to them. And the world would say, what's the big deal? I remember the first time I went to Hong Kong before it was taken over by the Chinese communists, or the, more correctly, the gov Chinese communist government, that coming up from the port where our ship was moored, you could see into buildings that had open fronts, uh, restaurants and so on, and, and a countless number, there would be a little shrine with a purple light or a yellow light. They're illuminating a statue and some idol, pagan god. And it was fascinating to see people stopping and giving a quick bow and then moving on as they passed that idol. And those are indeed something that still occupies the affections of a great portion of the human race. So what a, what a marvelous privilege it is to be delivered from idolatry. So how did Christ deal with the third and final temptation? He says, Be gone, Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only after stating it is written. So in thinking about this, Again, he quoted from Deuteronomy. What's some of the application that we can consider as important for us? Well, I'd ask you to turn, please, to Philippians chapter 3. I think this is a very helpful text to get this perspective. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8, 9, and 10. Philippians 3, verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Love that statement. It's a great perspective. So putting things right on the line, what's important. Of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, 
but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Wonderful statement of the gospel basics there. But he has an addition, and that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And that's, of course, a whole vast and glorious subject in itself, the power of his resurrection. And we do believe in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that has a number of important consequences for believers and for the kingdom. But then notice the last one. The fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. The fellowship of his sufferings. Now, that's a bit odd, isn't it? And we talk about fellowship with one another. And we think of fellowship with Christ. Our Heavenly Father, we have a form of fellowship with him through Christ. But the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, what's going on? And Paul is here calling us, I believe, to understand and appreciate and enter into applying, insofar as we can in the light of Scripture, the significance and the consequences of Christ's suffering. Jesus Christ came as a suffering servant. Not just a servant, but a suffering servant. And one of the ways that he suffered was being tempted by the devil at the beginning of his public ministry. Was he tempted during that three and a half years of ministry? Well, we know that at least on one occasion he said to no less a person than Peter, get behind me, Satan, when Peter tempted him with really the same thing Satan did to avoid the way of the cross. The suffering of the cross was the culmination of the suffering of Jesus Christ. So how do we enter into the fellowship of his sufferings? Well, I think the first is to under, seek to understand them biblically. And I think you have to begin with the temptations of Christ, or more correctly, the beginning of temptations. And get from that not only understanding the nature of what he had to face in the way of temptation, but appreciating for us the model for resisting temptation, as well as providing the judicial basis for claiming the grace of God to avoid temptation in the power and strength of the risen Christ. Adam failed in obtaining righteousness according to the first covenant, or we sometimes call it the covenant of works. Christ, in an environment that was hostile and not benign, began a successful accomplishment of the sufferings that would be necessary to pay the full debt of the just wrath of God against us. Would you turn to Hebrews 2, please? Hebrews 2. Verse 18. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, notice the connection. He himself was tempted in that which he has suffered. He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. His resisting of the temptations that were brought against him was a necessary part of constituting his high priestly prerogative in enabling us to overcome temptation. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Notice the emphasis on suffering that we just read in chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, 
For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, because we have this high priest who has been tempted but never caved in, never capitulated, never yielded, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we're told by Paul to follow Christ, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2 to follow Christ. There's a number of ways in which we're to follow him, and one of them is to study and understand how he resisted temptation in order that we may as well. Chapter 5 of Hebrews, verse 7. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. The suffering of Jesus Christ and the salvation of Jesus Christ of his people that he accomplished so perfectly can never be truly separated. And, of course, if you remember in our text, in our um, bulletin, I mean, we have the quote, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12 through 14, which was read at the beginning of the service, which reminds us that no temptation has overtaken us, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow us to be tempted beyond that which we are able. So some things to consider from particularly the perspective of love for Christ and thankfulness. Consider the cost Christ paid in respect to dealing with what came upon him as just the second Adam and just that more narrow field of view. Adam was created sinless and became corrupt. Christ was created sinless and remained holy. Adam rejected God's word. Christ upheld it perfectly and applied it perfectly. Adam rebelled against God. Christ perfectly submitted to God. Adam tempted God. Yes, he did. Tempted God in disbelieving that God would carry out his word concerning death to those who ate the fruit of the tree. Adam rebelled against God. Christ submitted perfectly. Adam tempted God. Christ obeyed to avoid any faint sense of testing God. And that, of course, is one of the foci of the actual three temptations by Satan. Adam yielded to Satan and to his temptations. Christ perfectly resisted Satan and his temptations. Adam was not jealous for God's way. In truth, he was not. He saw the fruit. It looked good. Eve had eaten it. He fell down in the same way, took it, forgetting what God had said, and ate. On the other hand, Christ was jealous for the commandments and obeying the will of God. Adam was seduced by Satan's misquoting scripture. Christ corrected Satan's misquote, or misquoting scripture. Adam wanted a higher rank. Remember that one of the things the devil offered was that you shall know wisdom like God. Adam wanted a higher rank. Christ did not. Paul tells us in Philippians that he came as the suffering servant. He humbled himself even unto death. The exact opposite of Adam, who was dissatisfied, obviously, 
with the glory that God had already given him, given him. Adam did not regard God's word as sufficient. Realize that. Christ did. Christ, who had supernatural power, chose to submit himself and wrap himself in the protection of God's word. Adam learned too late that disobedience bring consequences. Christ never had to learn that lesson because he obeyed perfectly from the beginning to the end of his life here on earth. Adam leaned on his own understanding. He reasoned, as did Eve, why they should take the fruit. They violated that great text in Proverbs chapter 3. In all your ways acknowledge the Lord and he shall direct your paths. Do not lean on your, on your own understanding or be wise in your own eyes. Adam violated that principle. Christ kept it perfectly. Adam failed in the most conceivably perfect circumstance possible. Christ was victorious in the worst circumstance possible. And what does that have to say to us in resisting temptation? Well, if we would be Christ-like and we understand that the actions of Christ and the words of Christ have instructive value for us in holy living, that cuts out from uh, any of us the excuse that we should not have to obey if we're under trial or difficulty. No matter how serious the trials we're undergoing and the temptations to cut corners, Difficulty and an unpleasant environment or set of circumstances is never sufficient to justify that. Adam acted with consummate selfishness. Christ acted out of consummately selfless love. He did this for us. He was willing to suffer, not just on the cross, but that whole period of his life really even before the temptation of Satan from the hardships he lived with. Adam had an abundance. Christ was poor for our sakes. Notice Christ's declaration. It is written. I've proposed already how important that was, that one of the best ways for us to resist temptation is to ask the simple question, what is does the Bible say? What does the Word of God tell us to do? Consider the duration of Christ's battle. Three and a half years, if our guesstimates are right in the time, his time in public ministry. He was persistent in his resistance, and his resistance to temptation was rewarded with successful persistence. Christ was jealous for his father's preeminence. Satan was jealous for himself and his wickedness. Do you think that adds a dimension to Christ being the second Adam? Can you see how that God designed, God ordained event of going into the wilderness, fasting for 40 days and nights, and then undergoing the temptations of Satan was to present to the world and to the human race a Savior who was willing to suffer for us and under the most difficult of circumstances and every imaginal type of temptation, not only being nailed to the cross, but in every other way that, is not, that we can conceive of. So I believe that if we see it rightly, the temptations or the beginning of the formal temptations of Christ as the Messiah being revealed and rejected is best encompassed in verse 1, 2, and 3 of Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. We can read that, the sin 
that so easily enables us to be tempted. That's what entanglement involves. And let us run with endurance, as Christ did, the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, there's the suffering of Christ again in focus, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, and including hostility by the devil, so that you do, may not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus Christ was tempted. I remind you, beloved, he was tempted for our sake as part of accomplishing the righteousness necessary to clothe us in holiness as we stand in the presence of Almighty God and as we come before him. Adam had to be clothed with animal skins and Eve to cover their nakedness. Jesus Christ was willing to be tormented and tempted and to suffer in order to cover our nakedness with his holiness. Praise be to God for his holiness in resisting the temptations of Satan, which had he yielded, could have ended hope of our redemption and that of everyone who ever was born. Praise be to God for his great love to us in Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there is no way we can adequately thank you sufficiently for your incredible love expressed in so many ways and not the least in which resisting temptation is the second Adam of providing for us as adopted children of the Most High God a holy example and a holy righteousness in resisting sin in its every form. We thank you that you are willing, Lord Jesus, to suffer in order to redeem us, that you are willing to suffer for three and a half years in countless ways in order to obtain for us the redemption that would permit us to be in your presence and the presence of your Heavenly Father and our Heavenly Father forever and forever. God grant us the grace, Father in heaven, to never trivialize what Christ did. Will you give us the grace to focus intently on every revelation concerning Jesus in Scripture and to treasure what is written about him, the better to love him, the better to know him, and the better to serve him. And we plead these petitions, all of them, in Jesus' most holy name. Amen.